With the energy grid transitioning into an increasingly decentralized, digitized, and decarbonized system, regulatory models are also changing to reflect the evolving role of electric companies. At the same time, electric companies are considering new services and offerings to expand their business models. With all of these changes happening, how will electric companies of the future operate? This is the question our next panel will explore. This panel features David Hutchins of Fortis Inc., Abigail Anthony of the Rhode Island Public Utilities Commission, and Laura Sandis, CBE, author of Recosting Energy and chair of the UK government's Digitalization Task Force. The session will be moderated by Phil Muller, EEI Executive Vice President for Business Operations and Regulatory Affairs. Without further ado, please welcome the panel to the stage for our next session, Evolving Business and Regulatory Models. Thank you, Vanessa, for setting the stage for our conversation today. The regulatory models of the future are going to be key to making sure that we have the clean energy transition occur in a way that benefits customers, assures reliability and affordability. Easy to say, much more difficult to actually do. And I know that during the GEF, there's been a lot of discussion about the role of regulators. I'm a former regulator myself, so I can add a few perspectives, but I'm thrilled that we have our panelists today that Vanessa introduced. And before we get into a discussion of regulatory models, I, uh, again, Phil Moeller with the Edison Electric Institute, wanted to give our panelists a chance to introduce themselves, talk briefly about their background and the organization that they represent, because given our worldwide audience, uh, maybe not everybody understands the role uh, that our various panelists play. I'll begin with David Hutchins, uh, the CEO of Fortis, as mentioned, uh, but also based in Canada. So adding to our international perspective, uh, my friend David Hutchins, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Phil, and, and thanks for inviting me to this panel. Looking forward to the conversation. Uh, I've been in the industry for uh, 25 years, mostly here in Arizona at our Arizona Utilities. I've been CEO here for uh, the past six years and joined Fortis uh, about six years ago when they purchased our company um, and been in this role uh, all of uh, three and a half months. So I'm, I'm really uh, excited to be in the new role at Fortis and uh, really uh, pleased to be in this industry during a time where I think there's just going to be a phenomenal amount of change and opportunity for um, every company in almost every part of our sector. So real quick, a little bit of background uh, on Fortis. Uh, we have 10 different utilities across North America and the Caribbean. We have, we, we have utilities in five different provinces. We cover nine different states in the United States um, we, and three Caribbean uh, countries. So quite a broad footprint. Uh, we have gas uh, utilities, electric utilities of every kind you can think of, distribution only, transmission only, generation transmission and distribution, fully integrated electric utilities, gas utilities. Um, it, when you look at our portfolio, we really are focused on energy delivery. 93% of our assets are related to transmission and distribution of energy, uh, whether that be uh, gas or electricity. And uh, we basically see about every regulatory model you can think of in those 10 different jurisdictions. So um, this, this is going to be a, a really uh, interesting panel. Uh, I have to say, you know, re reg regulation, uh, I, I basically I successfully hid from regulation for about maybe the first six or seven years of my career and then got uh, fully engaged in the processes, both from a state and a, and a, and a federal perspective. So um, there's nothing more important than than, than the regulatory relationships that you have in your in each of your jurisdictions. And that's obviously what we focus on in our utilities. Well, you have a, a fabulous perspective given that range of models and locations that you serve. And as you said, with 93% of your business coming from essentially regulated wires or pipes, uh, you nailed it. A regulation is absolutely key to the future. I, I will move on to Commissioner Anthony from the Rhode Island PUC. Commissioner? Good morning or afternoon, wherever you are. Um, unlike David and Laura, I am, um, I am one of three uh, regulators in the smallest commission in the smallest state uh, in the United States. Um, so essentially, uh, you know, a grain of sand out there. Um, here in Rhode Island, uh, we are uh, a fully restructured state, uh, which means that 
at the state level, we just regulate um, a distribution company when it, on the electric side and in a gas network company. Um, in Rhode Island, in fact, uh, we have one utility that serves about 98, 99% of the electric load in the state and uh, a, a couple of, you know, very, very small um, municipal utilities that serve um, the other the other small pockets. Um, <clears throat> prior to becoming a utility regulator in 2017, uh, I had worked in climate and clean energy advocacy uh, throughout the New England region. Um, I love the work uh, that I do here at the Public Utilities Commission, and, and I look forward to sharing more about it on this panel. Well, we appreciate you having um, your presence with us. And you may be a small state, but uh, you are clearly one of the leading thinkers among state regulators. And although it might be small, it does give you the chance to be a, a laboratory of sorts uh, on some of the ideas that we'll be discussing later. Laura? Thank you so much, Philip. Um, I've been involved in energy for the last 30 years in all sorts of different capacities. Uh, about 10 years ago, I did something crazy, and that was I became a member of parliament and very much focused on um, energy and climate change. Um, I did leave parliament voluntarily, and I'm almost re-entering the human race. Um, from that experience, um, I really started to look very closely at the whole regulatory framework in the UK. Designed um, 30 years ago, the grid was designed 70 years ago, and it felt that in this new world of transformation that there needed to be uh, quite a lot of, not even transformation, in some instances, uh, revolution. And so I've been working with Imperial College, one of our leading uh, universities and uh, something I'm a non-executive director of the Energy Systems Catapult at reshaping, uh, we publish um, sort of, you know, thought pieces called reshaping and redesign regulation. And the whole philosophy is that we're moving to net zero and the UK government made a big announcement today about uh, a, a 2035 target. And we plan from the future, not incremental change. And if we think about what that future will look like, regulators are going to have to understand data management, mobility, flexibility assets, multi-vector, um, digitalization, cybersecurity. It is no longer a vanilla linear regulatory model and risk will look very different. And hopefully we will talk more about it. Uh, my other role has been that I'm the government's uh, chair on their digitalization task force for energy. And we are going to look on a blank sheet of paper, we're going to look at the energy sector through a digitalization lens and um, hopefully come up with uh, a different shape for how the electricity system can work. Fingers crossed. You have an ambitious set of uh, uh, issues there, and we will get into more detail. And, and another time, maybe we'll swap stories about Lord Mogg, uh, the former regulator in the UK. But regardless, uh, we are, as you, as you noted, you set us up pretty well, Laura. We're in a period of, of great transformation. I think we all know that. But also, we are an industry that is the most capital intensive uh, and is a lifeline industry. If people don't have electricity, uh, they might not live. And so while we manage this transition from what was a, a, a fairly staid industry for maybe 60, 70, 80 years uh, to one that's now evolving dramatically, we not only have to look potentially at new business models, but how those business models evolve. And Dave, can I start with you? We, you, you talked earlier about so many different things you're seeing throughout your assets, North American, Caribbean. Uh, What's kind of your takeaway of the, the state of play and, and where are the areas or ideas that kind of uh, intrigue you or maybe excite you in terms of evolving uh, regulatory models? Yeah, it's, it is early days, Phil, but it, it is really refreshing now to see that basically the entire world is pointing in the same direction. And I think we're all of a day or two away from, you know, announcement of what that direction means in the United States. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, everybody is looking at 2050 and saying net zero by 2050 has to be the goal. Now, whether or not you put the, 
you know, the, the, the caveats around that about aspirational goal, et cetera, that's the goal. And that's what we're all, we're, we're all focused on now, but given that it's, that it's early days from a technology standpoint, because the, the, the follow-up to that goal is, but we don't know how we're going to get there yet. And so the regulatory models have to be flexible enough for us to adjust, um, to bring in new technology. And, and frankly, to be able to um, look at how we get how we're going to design and incorporate new technology into the regulatory structure structure and how we're going to get recovery for those types of assets. Um, so directionally, though, I, I see a couple um, key areas that I, I think will be uh, the focus of regulation on a going forward basis, both now and I think longer term. The first is having a more focus, a more a, a stronger focus on performance based regulation outcome focused. And I, and I think, uh, you know, that's common up in, in Canada, not quite as much in, in, in the United States. Um, we use it for all kinds of different things, customer metrics, we might use it for nibbling around the edges of, of environment, like energy efficiency standards, that kind of stuff that you, you know, that you get measured by, and that can go into your PBR structure. But we really haven't seen it uh, take root in uh, carbon reductions. And I think that's going to be key on a going forward basis to have that flexibility so that you can basically leave it to, to some extent, leave it mostly up to the companies and, and particularly in the, in, the, in the individual jurisdictions to figure out what works best for them and their portfolio in order to reduce greenhouse gases. Because at, at the end of the day, that's what it's all about. And to start measuring that, I think, is incredibly important. Um, the other is, is some non-standard investments, I think, that we see around the edges. When electric vehicle infrastructure is a, a, is a prime example of that, uh, both in Canada and in, and in the United States. How do you, if you want something done from an, from an infrastructure perspective, whether it's within our normal footprint from a utility perspective or normal infrastructure, or even around the edge, where are the folks to call, right? I mean, we are the ones who have access to the capital that if you want to build out a transportation, electrification, you know, infrastructure plan, we're the folks to call because we know how to do that. And at the end of the day, all that is, is just an extension of our systems to provide uh, infrastructure for, for transportation. Um, the other, I, I think, is, is probably the, the bigger concern and, mo and the most important concern right now is the view on the integration of all of the different energy systems. Because at the, at the end of the day, you have to have uh, the reliability and resilience of your electric grid as you become more and more dependent on it. Now we're starting you know, back to the electric vehicle conversation. Not only are you going to have things that you normally use electricity for, but now you're adding mobility um, to that equation. And the importance of the grid and the security and the resiliency and the reliability is absolutely paramount. So we're having a lot more conversations, particularly in the U.S., a couple wake up calls as as of recently that you know makes us pay attention to the the real um, integration and 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 interreliance of one system on another, and that's exactly what we need to be focused on, like really laser focused on, is how do all of those pieces come together? Because we're talking about electrifying more of our economy, and if you're not looking at how do you make that resilient from a fuel supply, and I use fuel. Loosely, I mean that's natural gas, renewable natural gas, hydrogen, you know, whatever that might be. Um, you have to make sure that you have all of those integrated to provide that resilience. Um, and it, I'll, I'll leave, I'll leave it, at, leave it there, Phil. Well, that's great, and I certainly uh, entirely endorse that position. And we had some tough reminders about it in the United States over the last year that. This is a very complicated system. It has to be working together in its pieces so that it doesn't fail. Before I ask Commissioner Anthony for her reaction to this, Laura, can, can you elaborate your answer on, on the question as to uh, where these models you think are going? I think the UK has clearly been one to, to be uh, experimental and forward thinking. But whenever you do that, you learn lessons, both good and bad. So uh, what are your thoughts? Well, very much sort of following up from, from David's um, contribution. And that is, I mean, if, if we just conceive what the energy sector was like in the UK, there are currently 400 key players, right? And everybody knows each other's golf handicap. I mean, that's what the sector looks like today. 
We are now moving to 50 million actions and assets because if you consider a, a, an EV car can do two actions, right? And we probably have about sort of 38 million cars in the UK. So you're moving for regulation, you can no longer, as David rightly criticized, process regulate. You have to what I would call perimeter regulate. And that creates the rules, but that you must never ever break, but allow in many ways companies to come to the outcome solutions um, that are carbon outcomes, that are consumer outcomes, and that are cost outcomes. But if you think as a regulator that you're going to be able to effectively regulate these 50 million actions and assets, right, you're going to fall over. So in some ways, it's the moment of pivot of change. And um, my background also included being, I was deputy chair of the Food Standards Agency, and they had exactly the same problem where they were regulating every cafe. They changed their regulatory model to actually shape around risk. And so they became a risk regulator rather than a process regulator. And that particular dimension is going to be incredibly important and changes the focus away from licenses to outcomes and strong penalties as well. So I, I would propose that we need perimeter regulation, which is based around risk, um, which is driven and incentivized to outcomes. That, that's an intriguing way to describe it. I'm not sure I've heard anyone put it quite in those terms before. So thank you for that observation. Commissioner Anthony, you have kind of the tough job now. Your reaction to that, uh, to those thoughts, and in addition, it might be worth explaining to the audience that you have your regulatory procedures and guidelines, but you're also subject to the state legislation uh, that sets those guidelines for you. So that's part of the equation as well. What are your thoughts? Yeah. <clears throat> yes, that's, ex that's exactly um, what I was going to say is that without firm policy, whether that policy comes from your state legislature or from the federal government, with, with in the absence of firm policy on climate, it's really hard for utility regulators to act on climate. So when you do have a firm policy, like in the United States, most states have what we call renewable portfolio standards or re renewable electricity standards. <clears throat> Having a firm policy like that makes it easier for the regulator to put the utility in the game. But in the absence of those policies, all we, we can just act around the edges. Um, so as David mentioned, we can use tools like performance um, incentives. We can adopt an avoided cost in carbon when we're doing cost benefit analysis. Um, but those are, those are pretty marginal. Um, Here's an example. In most New England states, including Rhode Island, as I mentioned, are restructured. Uh, so we send our distribution utility, you know, out to the market to contract for power, or we ask them to contract through bilateral, in, you know, bilateral contracts. But our law at the state level requires that bilateral contracts between the utility for renewable power have to be better than the market. There has, they have to. Um, they have, they have to beat the market. Now, without a strong price signal on carbon emanating from either state or federal policy, it's hard for those contracts to beat, to beat the power market prices. So regulators can liberally interpret law, but that doesn't get us anywhere near the goals that we need in order to you know, really address climate change at the most transformative levels. There isn't a regulatory model that's going to solve climate change. I mean, even if FERC, for example, were to, to pass a carbon tax, even that is only affecting the power sector. It still doesn't address the transportation sector or, um, you know, all the in, in New England, we have a lot of fuel for heating. It doesn't address, you know, other large uh, sources of, of emissions. Those are great points and uh, appreciate your perspective on that. I, I'm going to follow up with another question to you, Commissioner, and, and ask uh, Laura and Dave to respond. But let's assume that 
you don't get more of a policy direction either at the state level or the federal level. And you, you have to work around the edges on maybe not so much on fuel, but on how customers are able to manage their consumption better, better price signals, maybe technology that can be adopted to assist in demand management when prices are high and, and giving the right signals to consume uh, when prices are low and, and the system is flush with electricity. Uh, so a lot of people will say, you know, regulators need to be more bold, uh, take more chances. But uh, if things go wrong, uh, the people who are saying that are not going to get the blame. The regulators will. So I'm just interested in your philosophy on, on uh, getting back a little bit to Laura's point about risk. And um, I don't at all mean to be touching on anything that might be pending. But on the newer technologies and rolling those out to customers as, as, em, as empowering agents of their energy consumption, What's your approach? Where's your comfort zone? Um, are the things that uh, maybe the industry can be doing better to to help you in those tough decisions when uh, it's a little risky? Uh, the rewards are there, but there's potential for failure as well. So my general orientation towards risk, and I don't know that this changes from topic to topic. I think it's most regulators are approaching risk. Um, is that sort of as as Laura suggested? It's it's actually the foundation of utility regulation is to match risk and reward, just like investors do, right? We want to make sure that um, the whether it's the utility or the customers who are who are going to be exposed to risk, that that the reward that they might realize from that investment is is commensurate with the risk with the risk that they're taking on. I think one um, I guess phenomenon that that I experience here in Rhode Island is is often that the the, the distribution company is seeking to shift a lot of the financial risk of new investments onto the customers. Um, they ask, you know, there there's for as you suggested, uh, grid modernization proposals, for example, um, the utility will not advance a lot of technologies that fall under that grid modernization umbrella without having pre-approval of that investment or that cost from the regulator. And pre-approval, what pre-approval means is it means that, that the utility is shifting the decision-making about whether this is a necessary and prudent investment from themselves to the regulator. Um, in my view, this is what the utility's job is. Their job is to make prudent and necessary investments in their distribution system. Um, that's why they have executives and engineers and power system experts. Um, that's I don't have any of that expertise. And so I, you know, the easiest the most convincing way for utilities to make a business case proposal to regulators is to put some skin in the game first. Um, but what we're seeing is that utilities are seeking pre-approval of the cost of those new technologies from the regulators, which shifts all of the financial risk from the utility onto ratepayers. And um, I, that I think that that is one thing that might cause hangups when it comes to, as you suggested, investments in, in the kinds of technology that would allow customers to better manage their demand or for the utility to have better visibility and control of the distribution system down to say the end user level. Well, perhaps that's where uh, pilot projects can play a role. And sometimes uh, I know we've done on a lot of the EV charging uh, open to anyone who wants to provide it, but perhaps the electric companies uh, can get the approval to say build in underserved areas uh, but you, you you raise some some good points about uh, again where the risk falls Laura uh, again in the UK you've you've done some um, forward thinking and arguably risky regulation um, that I think has evolved from 
times where people were very happy with it, then people got a little less happy with it, but it, it certainly was transformational. What, what are your thoughts on, on the issue of, of how, how to uh, perhaps empower regulators to take more risk uh, and whether that's necessary? So I, I think Abigail makes a really interesting point, and um, I do crazy slideshows, which has got one of them's got a picture of a child screaming, and that represents some of the sector who sort of are infantilized by regulation, in the sense that they're not always making the steps that they should be making; um, they're waiting for permission. And so in some ways, we need to all grow up together. It's not just regulation that's in some ways living a little bit in the old, in an old fashioned world. It's also the sector too, too. And this then goes to Abigail's second point, and that's about risk allocation. And risk is in the UK. I can't speak for, for other parts of the world. In the UK, majority of risk is socialized. And if you do not have companies who are properly risk managing and are in many ways competitive in how they risk manage, um, everyone becomes quite sloppy. And as Abigail rightly says, all of the cost ends up with the consumer. Um, and so, you know, we, I've just done something called recosting energy where we're looking at the, the system again. And a key plank of this is to ensure that companies own the risks that they create and don't just pass it through the system. So I think that's really important. Um, I think also though, picking up on what Abigail was saying about costs, I think that um, we've got to start thinking about the future. And um, Jeremy Rifkin, who's a great uh, economist, American economist, is, makes the point that data in 1990, one terabyte was one million pounds, today it's five cents. And I actually think that that's the way an electron is going to be valued. I .e. will have very, very little value. And what in some ways that the regulators need to do is to understand that the value is moving to the system management um, aspect rather than the commodity. And that actually changes the nature of regulation and also will, to will very, be very much um, promote and need to promote flexibility and demand side. But that then requires a whole new range of regulation, consumer protection. Well, uh, we'll be watching those efforts very closely. Uh, I guess you do have the advantage of being essentially one market. And, and Dave, you're in so many jurisdictions, uh, so many different business models uh, where there's uh, uh, different elements of risk and you've got to allocate billions of dollars of investment every year. How do you take this topic and, and manage it given the diverse portfolio that Fortis has? Yeah, so let me let me start out by Phil, what you really posited was a question that says, how do you innovate in a risk averse environment? Right, I mean, that's that's the situation. Regulators are risk averse, utilities are risk averse, I mean, we were brought up in utilities to say the last thing that you can do is take risks because at the end of the day, and you hit it, Phil, which I, I love saying, um, you know, you didn't say it quite this way. We're the most important industry there is, right? I mean, we're the lifeblood of the economy. Nothing works without our electrons that we circulate around the economy. And so when you when you're basically have that mantle of reliability, resiliency, security, and you're always talking about those things, the idea of taking risk doesn't necessarily come right off the tongue. Now, when you think about, uh, you know, sort of that risk balance between whether you socialize it or whether you take it on within a utility or a company, you know, that varies by, by jurisdiction, varies by business type, business model, regulatory structure, all of those things. But I, I can say that, for, that I would bet that most utilities, particularly now, are really looking at ways to not only just grow their own utilities, and, and I don't mean that just from a capital standpoint or a, you know revenue or profit or whatever. I mean growing it from you know how do we serve more of our customers, more of the energy needs um, on the planet through clean energy. And when you look at it from that lens, and you say, okay, so what do we need to do? What we need is that balanced risk return, and this is usually where it gets sideways, and that's where we as, as utilities might come to a regulator and say, we're willing to take 
a little of this risk. Um, but if it goes good, we keep the money. If it goes bad, we'll basically eat it. Well, generally, it ends up getting a, a heads I win, tails I lose, you know, side of, you know, a story coming out of there, which is if it does fine, you can earn your return. Um, if it doesn't, you have to eat it. And it's like, well, wait a second. You got to have the ability to um, actually have success when you're taking that risk, to tie that risk in return for the things that are above and beyond the risk level that you would normally do within your portfolio. If you're, if you don't do that, if you can't have that conversation, if you can't figure out how to allocate that risk, you're not going to get anything done. Well said. And we're living in a world where certainly uh, the technology companies that uh, are are part of just about everybody's life and have, have provided customers with new optionality on how they consume and purchase goods. Uh, they, they certainly aren't under the regulated model that our companies are, and yet customers are increasingly interested in having those options throughout all their economic choices. So you, you summarized the dilemma quite well, and uh, it's something that we'll continue to, to deal with. I'm, I'm interested in more of an international perspective as we get closer to COP26. We've got uh, a major announcement coming out uh, this week in the United States on, on climate goals. How do we make sure that uh, regulation keeps that in mind, but also is cognizant of, of a just transition and the concern that we've all mentioned today about affordability? Um, that's a that's a lot of a lot of issues in there that play out differently in different parts of society. Uh, Laura, I'd like to start with you. Uh, you're going to be hosting uh, this year. Uh, your general thoughts on how uh, a good, hopefully substantive and thorough and uh, and meaningful discussion about how regulation plays as part of worldwide efforts in carbon reduction. Uh, your thoughts on that topic. So in, in the UK, our regulator is not responsible for carbon, and that is changing and actually um, as has been passed the legislation for net zero, it actually becomes a uh, nation, a national law. So it is driving change quite a lot. Um, but the regulation, I mean, in, in some ways also picking up a little bit from what David was saying initially is the regulation is going to have to start moving into the actual users. So the industrial sector, um, in, in, into heat where we've got a major problem because we're all, um, sort of gas, um, sort of carbon based, based heating systems. Um, and the regulation is going to have to allow in many ways, the speed of deployment, David's point about innovation, and we need to fail quickly, really. Um, we need to get out there and, and make things happen. And, see, and so there are quite a few um, interesting pilots. The company I'm a non-executive director on is, is a gas network, and we're putting in some pilots in Scotland for hydrogen into people's homes, green hydrogen. Um, and I hope very much that we'll be able to pilot and in many ways showcase these at COP, that there is a huge opportunity um, to be in, in many ways for smaller companies as well to both innovate and profit from the transition. Um, I also work a lot on the just transition issue and it is really, really complicated. And in the UK, you will have to spend money on changing your car and changing your whole heating system. And I don't know how many people on this call have got twenty to $30,000 just sitting around waiting to uh, energy efficient their home and change their car. The question has to be asked is who will pay? Because this is not hard pressed consumers who are going to be able to do this. So we're going to have to create the mechanisms by which we can allow, and I would propose it was really best to do this through service contracts rather than commodities. And I think we're going to be moving quite far away from um, commodity prices actually hitting consumers. So I can see different business models having to unlock those capital assets. Well, we could have a whole day's discussion about where, at least in this country, wholesale market price rules should go, given that we're moving toward 
marginal costs approaching zero. And that's not what these rules were designed for. So that that an, a future discussion, but one that will need to be uh, 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 will need to occur at least in this country, uh, given the challenges. I'm glad you brought up kind of pilot projects where companies can partner with, uh, say, technology companies. I know we've had a lot of that in the United States. They share the risk. They can bring some expertise and hopefully uh, soothe or ease regulators' concern about there being too much risk on the regulated entity. Uh, Dave, what, what are your thoughts on this general topic, given, again, the wide range of locations that you provide service to? Yeah, let me, let me address that part that you just mentioned on uh, partnering with technology companies um, and research and development. That's going to be key. And, you know, when, when you look at partnerships that we have, this is, a, you know, both in the U.S. and in Canada with uh, Energy Impact Partners, for instance, which is obviously a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a company that looks at investing um, in technologies that are going to basically clean up our energy system. And what better way for us as a utility to get involved, not only to see the new technology coming, but in, to invest in it and hopefully, you know, speed it along. Uh, in Canada, as, as I talked about that risk sharing mechanism, some, some of those are, are socialized costs. Um, we actually have a, a, a call it an R&D fund, a portion uh, in our rates in, uh, in British Columbia that is used to invest in uh, the Natural Gas uh, uh, Innovation Fund which allows us to look at how do we clean up the natural gas system? How do we look at clean tech and use it from a natural gas perspective to make sure that we're, you know, wringing all the value that we possibly can out of those assets. Um, so those are the kind of things that I think we have to look at more broadly across, um, you know, across North America, across the world, frankly, and figure out how to, you know, just kind of nibble around the edges and, and use a little of that R and D, the pilot programs, et cetera, um, to, to hopefully bring those, uh, technologies to maturity, test them out, and if they don't work or another a better one comes along, we all have to be able to accept that, right? We all that you, fail fast, as I think what you said, um, I think Laura said that, is you, you got to get in there and, and say, well, is this going to work or not? And if not, let's move on to something else. Um, but the whole just and equitable uh, conversation, that, that's, a, that's huge, right? Because you, you start with this conversation at the global level. This is all about global greenhouse gas reductions. And everybody's got to come to the table and put something on the table. But there's, there's, you know, there, the, the, the equity has to be from the perspective of geographic, which generally means company, state, provinces, etc. It has to be generational because we, we know that we're not going to fix this tomorrow. And then within the, the confines of your country or your jurisdiction, you have to look at it from a demographic perspective. And that's, that's a lot of, a lot of ways to have to make sure that we're doing this right. And you can't do that unless you're having a lot of conversations, setting that goal at that global level and seeing how that comes down. Because at the end of the day, um, as Laura said, it is about who pays. But a lot of times following up on right on the tails of who pays is, wait a second, where is the money spent? Because that's economic development for somebody um, who benefits from you know, is it, uh, you know, who's going to benefit from these investments in greenhouse gas reductions? And it's not necessarily those who pay or necessarily where the dollar spent. It's who's going to be sort of on the bubble of, of beneficiaries. And at the end of the day, the, the part that I think has to be key, because you, you will throw out all of the value and all the work that you do in figuring out how to do this um, and, and share those dollars, and you will create more pushback on, on our efforts to get to net zero if you don't do it as cost effectively as possible. And that's the part where you really have to talk about where is the dollar spent and is that the best place to spend them? Is that the cheapest, you know, dollar per ton carbon reduction that we can do on the planet? We got to set up that curve and just start hitting it from the left side to the right. Well said. And of course, this is a global issue given the ubiquitous nature of carbon concentration. But then at the end of the day, it comes down to the people on the front line, like Commissioner Anthony, who has to make the tough decisions, calls the balls and strikes, whatever sports analogy you want. And I know these issues are important to you and I'm curious about your thoughts and, and particularly, um, you know, the, the, the age old question of how to communicate with customers slash citizens who are the, uh, the ones paying for this and who may or may not care or understand 
the trade-offs involved. Yeah, so I have a couple thoughts that sort of work through the hierarchy of what David mentioned, sort of global to local to, to my hearing room. Um, you know, at the global level, um, wealthier nations have created, generated the most emissions. So I think that to the extent that our wealthier nations will have to make the earlier investments that are riskier in order to arrive at the best set of solutions, you know, that is surely part of an equitable transition, you know, in my opinion. When I come, you know, at the state level here in Rhode Island, one thing that I is be sort of coming into focus for me is that the goalposts are going to continue to move. So Rhode Island's state legislature is is very likely to pass a 100% clean electricity standard by 2030, you know, in the coming weeks. Um, when we are at 100% by 2030, people are going to want to be 200% um, clean electricity. And I know that because we already have municipalities who are entering into contracts to be 120% or 150% Re, um, re, you know, renewable electricity right now. Um, so, you know, it, and when you combine that with utilities are still going to be in the business of selling capital intensive infrastructure. And so they're also going to want to continue to find a way to, you know, sell more capital intensive infrastructure. And, you know, the way I think about this is, is that, Anytime we economies are buying more than we need of something, um, that should be understood to be a negative thing for global economies and equity because of the upward pressure that it'll place on costs. So somebody in Rhode Island might feel good um, that they're 200% renewable and they're supporting the re you know renewable energy market, but somebody in um, somebody who's just trying to to turn their lights on or somebody who's just trying to have electricity for the first time, maybe being priced out of that. So that's something that I'm thinking about in sort of this equity conversation. And then when it comes right down to our hearing room, I think that one thing that people uh, often overlook about utility regulation is that um, in at least in, in the United States, utility regulation is uh, very limited in its ability to be progressive in cost allocation. Utility bills are very regressive. Um, so to the extent that our policymakers want to see more equity in utility bills and in utility regulation, they should be giving us that ability in, in our charters. And when they're writing new laws, they could be considering how to allow utility regulate, regulators to allocate the costs and benefits of utility investments in a way that doesn't erode the equity that they're trying to create. But well said. Uh, we have about 10 minutes before closing comments. And so uh, we have a question that has come in and it, it follows up really, Commissioner, right on uh, the, the same point you made, but I would also like Laura and David to respond to it. The question is, Regulatory processes can be notoriously slow. Is there any indication that regulation will start moving more quickly given the speed at which new technologies are coming online? We've touched, touched on it a little bit earlier, but uh, your direct reaction to that question. My, oh, my, re, my direct reaction? Um, my direct, my immediate reaction is that uh, regulators don't often take a long time to approve slam dunk proposals. So if something is uh, dragging, it's you know taken a long time to move through the regulatory process. That may be because um, the proponent of the case didn't put forward a highly compelling business case to the regulator. Um, the regulator is often looking at a case uh, like an investor, and um, you know we're looking for a compelling case of need. Why is this investment needed? Is it a power system need, a statutory requirement? Are you responding to customer demand? We're looking for a value case um, using benefit cost analysis to show us what value um, the investment is going to, to deliver. And we need to understand the accountability um, to that investment 
to what extent are the customers who are paying for the investment are to what extent are they going to be the beneficiaries and how can we hold the utility accountable to delivering on those benefits so <clears throat> Like I said, I think that if, if things are dragging their way through regulation, it may be because the regulator is not getting the information that they need to make a decision, or maybe the case just isn't strong enough. Thank you for those comments. I, I know that at least in some case, in some states, uh, of course, the statutes are going to differ and they will determine whether, for instance, there can be uh, pre-filing conferences between some of the proponents and other interested parties uh, those tend to uh, tend to be beneficial to work out some of the details before everything has to go onto the written record uh, as an example of maybe a way to slow up, speed up the process in some areas. Laura, what's your reaction to the question of uh, notoriously slow regulation? Well, I have to say, I, I feel great sympathy for all regulators because, as Abigail's been pointing out, she's also bound by legislation, um, by the vagaries of politics, uh, by the fashion of politics. So, in some ways, that statutory environment is, it, it is quite difficult to shift, and particularly when one's talking about quite technical aspects. Now, I don't mean to be promoting crises, but always a good crisis is a great opportunity to innovate. And regulators actually do innovate very quickly when there's a big crisis. And so what is absolutely crucial is those people who are excited by reform have a nice, um, well-baked reform package in their bottom drawer that suddenly comes out to solve the problem, right? Um, so, but they, it will only change, in my view, the regulatory framework, not necessarily the commissioner's um, decisions, um, every 20 to 25 years. And that's why in the UK we're going through um, a big consultation around governance and what that needs to look like and how, what those outcomes are. And we know that we have got to plan this as if we were in 2030, 2035. We cannot plan it in an incremental way, otherwise um, it will be out of date within two or three years. So I think that there's very important to use crises, but to ensure that the framework is, is future-proofed. And that's why this perimeter approach is helpful because the perimeter can allow that innovation to um, to emerge and to succeed or to fail um, quickly. I don't know whether you have this in the US, but in, in the UK, we have what's called an innovation sandbox. And that allows people not to have to go through a sort of submission type environment where they just talk about new business models, they talk about new technologies, etc. And that then with the regulator and they all get excited about what could happen and then it's allowed to happen in, in a very relaxed, controlled environment. And again, a lot of that has shown failure quickly and pivot and it's the second iteration of those innovations that have been successful. Well, very, very interesting. I think we might be following up on the sandbox idea, but uh, with COVID restrictions, we will call it something else. D David, uh, what are your reactions uh, to this general topic? Yeah, I, so there, there's a, there can be a couple of reasons for it. One, one's easy to fix, which is resources. If your regulators don't have resources, you should be lobbying to make sure that they get the resources that they need because there is a lot of stuff going on in every regulatory jurisdiction. If, and if we don't realize that they need the resources to be able to address it, you know, quickly and easily. I mean, you, you can't you can't fault a regulator if they've got a stack of work on their desk that they just can't get to because they don't have the staff to do it. And so that that's that's one set. So that that's a problem that you can solve. Um, you know, the other the other one that I think Abigail hit the nail right on the head is you know the two. Well, you, you don't want to surprise either your regulator or your boss, right? I mean, those are the two things that you learn in the utility industry is don't go up there with something brand new that they just read about in a filing that they never heard about. It's all it's up to us to make sure that we are spending the time with our regulators and all of our stakeholders to make sure that by the time something gets on a regulator's desk, it, it, they, they know all about it. They've been briefed by the staff. They might have 
had a conversation with you or your people over the last year or however long that it might be. Um, that that's that's absolutely like fundamental rule number one of being a regulated anything, which is make sure that you're having those constant conversations and and not surprising um, your regulators. But yeah, I I think um, that sandbox idea is great too because you have to. That goes back to that risk and return you know bucket. We need something that's not a whole lot of money. That's you know kind of in that that combination of innovation. R and D, you know, sandbox. It can be programs and and allow us as a you know as a utility to work with the regulators and our stakeholders to come up with some of these ideas and test them. And nowadays, you have so much data available when you do anything that you can pause, see whether it worked, had the intended effects, see whether the customers adopted it, um, and then keep keep iterating from there. Um, but not not getting too worried about well you know, how much money is spent there and what was the return is like no what was the result not what was the return. Well, that's good. It, it, it strikes me that uh, the EIP model and similar entities uh, may be better informing regulators as to what they're doing and how they're doing, knowing that some of those are going to fail, but some are going to succeed. We're getting pretty tight on time, so I have one last question. I'd like you to be as uh, as quick as you could be, please, but. Uh, ESG and the issues related to uh, transparency are only going to increase. And it's important that our companies tell their story in a way that's effective, but also isn't too burdensome. And Dave, can I start with you? Your thoughts on, on how we address these issues with the interested communities, which certainly include regulators, but is broader than that. Well, the interested community is everybody on the planet. I mean, there there is not a stakeholder that comes and talks to us that isn't, they might not say the three letters ESG, but they're focused on environmental, social, and, go and governance. And those are the probably the most talked about topics now when we meet with um, investors, when we meet with employees, when we meet with customers, all of those things have bubbled up to the top. And I think probably the thing that we need, um, not just in our industry, but generally, is the ability to, to provide the information and data related to those three buckets so that people can digest them. So, you know, I, I know we've had a lot of different, um, you know, I'll say indices pop up that we're all, that we all chased. I remember EEI, you know, was early, early on was attacking this in the U.S., trying to get, you know, some structure on how we report some of our uh, environmental aspects. And, you know, it takes a time for some of those things to shake out, but a lot of those have shaken out. So now we need to start picking some and all of us jumping on the same bandwagon using the same measures. Now, the E part is probably easier as we go forward. The S is going to take some development time on how do you measure what you're doing from a social perspective. Uh, and the governance one has been measured for forever. So that one's you know almost fully baked. But I, I really expect us to start landing on those common standards so they can look at them almost like um, credit rating agencies and say, ah, A minus, beautiful. Okay, move on. We know what their rating is. Yeah, and that's where I think the, the EEI ESG template that's in its second iteration is, has been uh, adopted by almost everybody and, and some of our European member companies, too. Uh, again, we're tight on time, but uh, Laura, your thoughts on the ESG, the transparency, the reporting that's relevant but not burdensome? So I, I chair the SGN ESG committee, and I'd love to see the EEI's uh, template. Um, I, I think, absolutely like David, it's a license to operate, and without absolute clarity about what you want to do, you do not have a license to operate, particularly in our space, which has got a, a lot more sort of public uh, facing. Um, I mean, there is a potpourri of these, um, create, you know, metrics, and that's got to be rationalised out. It is absolutely, you know, if you go back 30, 40 years, health and safety was a sort of, not quite a nice to have, but it was, you know, a little bit optional up to a point. ESG is, it is, is like health and safety is today, and we need to move into it. I totally agree with David that the S is is more complicated. Um, I think we've got some very good employment law in the UK, which actually really stops some of those th issues. But I would say that modern slavery is one of the big, big issues. We've just passed legislation in the UK around that, where you will find pockets of suppliers 
not necessarily the energy companies, their suppliers and their contractors where um, some unattractive things are going on when it comes to um, employment and modern slavery. Well, we'll be happy to get you the EEI uh, template on this. Uh, Commissioner Anthony, what do you want to hear on these set of issues? How I know you care about them. Uh, what's relevant in your role? Um, <clears throat> so, I, I mean, I think I've, I would just have one suggestion, um, which is that to the extent that utilities and other um, regulated entities are, are, are um, th those who need to come into compliance with uh, renewable energy standards or renewable portfolio standards um, to the extent that they would all be willing to do their rec trading or their trading for renewable energy certificates on a blockchain that would later become public. Um, I think that that would really increase the security and the integrity of our clean energy markets. Thank you for that. Um, we're getting pretty close to the, the end of our time. We've had a wide ranging and a substantive discussion about, of course, recognizing that uh, regulation is going to be a key, absolutely, going forward, perhaps for perpetuity, as we move toward a cleaner energy transition. It's a, a model that's going to differ from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. It's probably going to depend on the, the laws that set the parameters for that regulation but I would think that most of us would agree that more flexibility is better, uh, regardless of how that comes along, uh, especially as we look at the, the models that can tolerate a little more risk, but have to be flexible as well. I'd like uh, each of you to provide maybe just 15, 20 seconds of closing comments. I'll start with Commissioner Anthony, go to Laura, and then Dave. Um, like I said, I, I love the job as a utility regulator, but I think the most important thing for people to understand is that regulators don't make decisions based on the information that we have. We make the decisions based on the information that is provided to us by utilities and other parties um, that come before us. And so I think focusing on making the best cases possible is um, one of the surest ways to be successful at your regulator. Great advice. Thank you. And thank you for part participating today. Laura? Um, I would urge regulators to get out a lot more out of the energy sector and look at other regulatory models from other sectors. But I would also say to um, the sector itself is that you need to, in some ways, not be held back by regulation. It is a partnership. It needs to move together. And you need, as Abigail rightly says, to give the regulator confidence, but realize that the sector is becoming very much more consumer focused, which isn't actually a very natural place for the energy sector to operate. So any crisis with consumers, they have a veto on net zero and they will bite hard if we get it wrong. Well said, and thank you for joining us from the other side of the pond. David? Yeah, I'd say, I think from a regulation standpoint, we really have to focus on outcome-based um, regulation and whatever you call that effort, perimeter regulation. I love that. I'm, I wrote that down. I'm going to use that uh, on a going forward basis, but that's what it is, is set, set the perimeters. You know, the two biggest things we have to worry about are resiliency and reducing greenhouse gases. So that's it. Focus our regulation around uh, how to do that and figure out what kind of business model that you're going to need in order to you know, meet your customers' needs and demands related to that. Um, it, again, this is this is the, the probably the the next five to ten years. You know, as we are going to hear later this year, where the United States is going, which drives so much across you know international borders. Um, this is going to be a really exciting time for us in the in the utility industry to to see where it's going to develop to, to develop our business models accordingly, and to make sure at the end of the day that we're meeting what our customers demand, and that's clean energy that they can rely on. Again, very well said. It's been my honor to be your moderator uh, for my, this panel today. To our audience throughout the world, thank you for your attention, and uh, please continue to watch future sessions of the Global Electrification Forum. Again, a good day to all, wherever you are in the world. Thank you again to all of our panelists for such an insightful conversation.
as we all know, our energy systems are very complex. And I liked your points about how customers, companies, and regulators will all need to grow together and reframe risk on the path to 2050.